There's nothing quite like a clone. Every now and then, a game comes along that defines a genre. One that becomes the go-to, the standard bearer, and the bar for everything to be compared to. Your Pokemons, Dark Souls, Dooms, Sonics, all games that had a ton of success that were then, of course, used as inspiration, had mechanics replicated, and in some cases, straight up ripped off. I've talked about a lot of these in the past, but there's no game out there that was cloned as shamelessly as Grand Theft Auto. Which is weird, because it's not even the first one of these. Open world driving and crime action games have been around since the 80s, though I don't think many people have played like Miami Vice on the Commodore 64. Heck, I doubt many modern gamers even know what Driver or Carmageddon is. Not that I blame ya. Rockstar's Grand Theft Auto has humble beginnings as a top-down version of itself that got kinda middling reviews and wasn't really, well, much of anything. I don't think anyone's going around making a big deal about the first few games here, except of course a group of concerned parents that gave the game way more notoriety than it should have gotten. It wouldn't be until Grand Theft Auto 3 that things would really take off. GTA 3 was the first time a 3D sandbox video game started to make the rounds in the schools for me. It was this mystical M-rated thing where you can run around shooting anyone with anything. Gangsters, civilians, cops, it didn't matter. You could be as big of a nuisance as you wanted to be while also going through a wacky and memorable campaign filled with characters who'd curse at you all the time. That and you can do the big nasty. Somebody please Please call Jack Thompson. From here, the floodgates went wide open. For every new entry in the Grand Theft Auto series, you'd get 10 times as many clones. Suddenly, every publisher was making an open world crime drama game with mechanics that looked like copied homework, and this was just how it was gonna be for a while. Some of them great, some of them not so great, and some of them totally baffling. If you wanted yourself a Vin Diesel flavored GTA clone, you got it. Remember Wheelman? So yo, it's Austin, and today we're gonna be jacking a car and driving straight into the strange world of Grand Theft Auto clones. This whole concept's funny because of how common the genre of games used to be before they kind of just disappeared. You gotta wonder why. There's a lot of examples of this, and we're gonna be getting into it, but before we get started, we got a sponsor. I wanna talk to y'all about Incogni. Security is important, and unfortunately, we live in a world that's had several data breaches on very popular websites leading to a lot of cases of identity theft. This is something I've had to deal with myself. Suddenly lots of personal information, real sensitive stuff is just sitting there on the net and it's really hard to do something about it. Like, you know, maybe you made an email address specifically to avoid spam. You buy a t-shirt and then suddenly that email address is filled with spam. It's like, what happened? Well, that's where Incogni comes into play. Incogni is a service that works to remove personal data from the internet. Simply create an account, input the things that you want to take down and Incogni will reach out to data brokers to get that done for you. They contact data brokers on your behalf to get your personal information removed from their databases while keeping you updated in real time. It's that simple. Now no one's gonna know about my shopping habits except like all of you watching this channel which means uh, everyone will know I like to play terrible games. But that's not so bad. I've done my part and now it's your turn. Click the link in the description and the first 100 people to use the code eruption are gonna save 20% and it's something that I do recommend. If you want to reclaim your personal data for yourself, check out Incogni today. Grand Theft Auto clones. Now, not too long after GTA 3 came out, we would start to see imitators on the shelves. It would take a little bit of time though. So I figured why not start with one of the most obvious from that era. Have y'all ever heard of true crime? No, not the podcasts, like the game series. Prior to three, Grand Theft Auto developer DMA Design worked on a game that used a lot of that open world formula. Body Harvest for the Nintendo 64 shares a lot of the same DNA that GTA 3 has, and it's pretty obvious when you play it. The whole concept of the open world game was a newer thing, certainly not exclusive to Grand Theft Auto, but GTA 3 certainly stood out the most. So when I saw a new game on the shelf simply called True Crime with a dude pointing a gun at me, I could immediately tell what was up. GTA was a cultural phenomenon in the early 2000s, and so it was a no-brainer to try and capitalize on the formula. The open-world mission-based sandbox is a tried and true format, so why not do something similar? Well, True Crime does a lot of the same, but instead decides to reverse the role. Activision's True Crime Streets of LA is the brainchild of Luxoflux, the people behind Vigilante 8, Star Wars Demolition, and Shrek 2. I remember when this was coming out that it was one of the first games that made me do a double take. Like, whoa, this looks familiar? But Street was a pretty decent thing on its own. Sure, the shooting was super janky, but it flipped the script by letting you play as Detective Nick Kang, a LAPD officer who's gotten in trouble for excessive force, maybe a bit, hmm, in 2022, but it's a game with a star-studded cast, including Christopher Walken and Michelle Rodriguez. Gamers. <laughs> 
it reviewed well and was successful enough to get itself a sequel, actually. True Crime New York City, this time trading the 7s and 8s for 4s and 5s, stirring up a ridiculous amount of controversy, and if you're playing the Xbox version, having a game-breaking bug so bad that you can't finish it. <laughs> nice. True Crime New York is this miserable, drab, and mostly gray-looking experience that was way too little too late. They leaned a little more into the GTA format, but by the time this came out, Grand Theft Auto San Andreas was already out, and that's kind of in the upper echelon of all 6th generation video games. After playing a game with a ridiculous amount of activities, a huge world filled to the brim with things to do, and a narrative that explores the gray area of gangs in the 90s, a game that lets you do this is a little bit tasteless. Yo, that car exploded though. Oh yeah, I forgot. It's incredibly buggy. The world has little to do in it while being extremely large and empty. If you're playing this on the PlayStation 2, I hope you enjoy 14 frames a second, like the entire time. Not even famed actors Lawrence Fishburne and Mickey Rourke could save this one. This game lets you do the good cop, bad cop thing and it's intrinsically weaved into the gameplay. Gotta keep track of your bad cop points. Don't wanna get the bad ending. Thankfully, you can easily track this on your Motorola phone. Advertising. This game didn't do well, critically or commercially, so of course Activision would begin work on another one. Not with Luxoflux this time, but with United Front Games, the developers of Mod Nation Racers, a game I actually really like. And then that game, True Crime Hong Kong, was cancelled. The IP was thrown into the gutter and deemed that due to quality issues, no amount of additional investment would make it good. Ouch. Well thankfully, Square Enix picked it up, rebranded it as Sleeping Dogs and made one of the best GTA clones out there, even if they deemed it a failure that didn't meet sales expectations. Then there was a spin-off multiplayer game called Triad Wars, and there was gonna be a Sleeping Dogs 2, but both of those got cancelled. It's just really unfortunate. It's not every day that a Grand Theft Auto clone gets a new franchise that gets a cancelled game that gets resurrected by another company into another franchise that's also promptly cancelled as well, but Sleeping Dogs deserves better. You can usually pick up the definitive edition for cheap, and you should. It's got a little less this. Let's move on to something a little bit different for a second. Now, you'd be seeing a lot of straight crime style games come out of this genre, but in 2004, you'd see something a little more out of the box. And no, not Jack 2, but American McGee's Scrapland. Who in the world is American McGee? Well, it's his actual name for starters. He's an ex-car mechanic turned game developer who kind of floated around in the old school shooter space in the 90s, as early as Wolfenstein 3D before moving on to projects like Doom and Quake with id Software. Well, after leaving id in 1997, I guess he joined in on the whole name brand thing we saw with John Romero. I'm sure we all remember the time that Romero decided that he was going to make us his with Daikatana. Well, American McGee did the same thing. Firstly, with Alice, a third-person action game from 2000 that I remember being ridiculously difficult. It's based off the classic Alice's Adventures in Wonderland, just like all kinds of media these days. This game was a bit of a darker look at the character and world. The uh, Cheshire Cat's horrifying smile has stuck around with me for decades. Alice would get a sequel, Madness Returns, that I really want to talk about at some point, but that 11-year period where Mr. McGee was attaching his name to every project he had was interesting. I think easily the most ambitious, though, would be the first game by Spanish video game developer Mercury Stream, American McGee's Scrapland. Yeah, that's Metroid Dread, by the way. The original Xbox had a handful of exclusives that have gone under the radar as hidden gems, and I think Scrapland is one of them. It's this space robot adventure that's packed with personality and weird quirkiness. It's got this big open space colony world that you have the ability to fly freely around between missions. You even have to run from space cops here and there. I remember enjoying this, but I think it got a little buried by other big 2004 releases like Half-Life 2, World of Warcraft, Halo 2, Metal Gear Solid 3, and, well, Grand Theft Auto San Andreas. But what you do have is a pretty decent GTA clone that only really suffers from some technical issues on the original Xbox. The backwards compatibility is a little rough, at least on mine. You play as a self-made robot named Detritus who's just trying to fit into society. You get to the colony Chimera where you're supposed to have a job and the only one that's available is a reporter because no one wants to do it. Along the way, you get the ability to build ships, engage in high-speed races and dogfights and explore an impressively large map for some something that was an original Xbox game. It also looked pretty good for the time. The main issue here is that it's a little too uh, unfocused. There's a lot of on foot segments where you can fight dudes and you'll get the ability to basically kin yourself into other robots, but they don't feel anywhere near as good as the ship segments. Also, despite having an open world to explore, there's not much variety as you would probably have hoped. 
but they did make sure to give us a sexy robot. Don't you dare look at her like that in front of the boss. They're engaged. It sounds like me at 13. Some of the voice acting's a little weird. There's a lot of dialogue in Scrapland with cutscenes taking up nearly two hours. It's just that the story isn't great. Unfortunately, in a lot of aspects, it kind of falls a little short of its ambitions and wouldn't be fully realized until the remastered PC version that came out last year. It's definitely a flawed game, but one of the neatest Grand Theft Auto clones to come out in this era. I think if this game came out in like 2008 or 9, with a little more time behind it, we could have gotten something way more fleshed out. Just think of the bangs. The bangs would have looked great. So how about we take ourselves a trip to the land of licensed games? My specialty. You bet your sweet thing that GTA was gonna have a lot of licensed clones. Like, come on. And I played most of them. If you've ever thought about playing The Sopranos Road to Respect, don't. I think the closest any game came to fully capturing like a Vice City vibe though was Scarface The World Is Yours. Yeah, for this one they actually changed the ending of the movie to one where Tony Montana survives and decides that everyone in Miami must die. From the way weapons and things glow on the ground to the freaking Hawaiian shirt on Ali P, this just screams GTA. Scarface was received well enough, but I for one am more interested in something like The Godfather. For starters, how does somebody watch this film and think, you know what? This could be a video game. Well, I'll tell you why. <laughs> this little thing right here. The Godfather. One and two. Yeah, there's a sequel. And both of these games are pretty good. I'm gonna focus on the first one though because I feel like it was just crazy ahead of its time. And no, you don't play as Don Corleone. Weirdly though, Al Pacino decided not to let them use his likeness to reprise the role of Michael, so instead we get to create a character named Aldo. One whose entire motivation is enacting revenge. A typical mobster story. The game itself was shot well, looks extremely good for the time, and has actual cinematography that was mo-capped. Considering a ton of games on the PlayStation 2 weren't that, you could tell they put a lot of budget into this. It's just unfortunate that the entire thing is uh, not approved of by the director. I'm very angry with you. Apparently this game was all done without the yes or knowledge of Francis Ford Coppola. Paramount just kind of did everything behind his back. Quote, I had absolutely nothing to do with the game and I disapprove, I think it's a misuse of the film. And yeah, probably. But it's also kind of fun. The PlayStation 2 version of The Godfather was developed by Page 44 Studios, who at this point didn't have too much under their belt and well, not too much after either. Tony Hawk's proving ground, anyone? Well, they made the combat here look absolutely brutal. A majority of the encounters you do early on will be a good old hand to hand and there's some straight up violent looking executions you can do. And they happen quick too. You put a gun in that and it's like surprisingly realistic feeling. And then it gets really stupid and sometimes you'll have your character doing a crossroads out of nowhere, feeling the adrenaline in his soul. The map here is pretty sizable as you can drive from video game New York to video game New Jersey and a lot of the environments look different. Since you are part of the mob, one of the main things you do here is shake down local businesses in order to get them to pay for protection, you see? All while your character stares wide-eyed at something. It's a little unnerving. Look, all I'm saying is that there's not many games out there with an intimidation mechanic where you have to beat the crap out of them, their property, and friends in order to get them on your side. It's a really unique thing, but definitely loses a bit of the film's uh, subtlety. Press X to threaten their family. I can see why a lot of people might be opposed to this game's existence, with it being tied into the classic film Godfather, but I don't think it's bad either. The biggest knock against it that I have is that there's a lack of variety, but like, that's pretty good, all things considered. Then the sequel. It's been a while since I touched this thing and I remember liking it, but also the reviews were extremely mixed. The game sold so poorly it couldn't even break 250,000 units and they canceled the entire franchise. Karma for IP extortion? Maybe, but also a shame considering they had plans to make Godfather 3 the video game. I'll come back to the sequel another time because there's simply way too many games to talk about. Let's move on but stay in the license lane for a second because there's one more thing I want to talk about and it's the Simpsons hit and run. When this game came out, it was totally a meme for being exactly what it is, but you know what? It, it really is a Grand Theft Auto clone. Okay, here we go. The Simpsons. Everyone knows The Simpsons. Everyone knows Simpsons video games, but not everyone's played them. Be it the original arcade game, Wrestling, the one based off the movie, or Bart's Nightmare, which has never left my mind, there's been simps for generations.
Oh, wait, no. 2003, the height of Grand Theft Auto's burgeoning popularity, two years after the crazy taxi clone they made, would come The Simpsons Hit and Run. This game frequently tops people's lists for best licensed games as well as best Simpsons games, and well, that's for a good reason. Hit and Run kind of rules. I don't think it would be inaccurate for me to say that Hit and Run kind of became like the kid-friendly version of Grand Theft Auto. At least for me, at 13 years of age, I wasn't allowed to touch anything M-rated, especially Grand Theft Auto, because, well, you know, my parents at least tried to shield me from the video game hyperviolence. Sucks to them that I'd already used the internet for far more nefarious things, like writing Super Smash Brothers fanfiction. Ten bucks to whoever finds it first. The Simpsons had already hit the apex of its popularity and was beginning its slow declining to whatever the heck it is today, but when Hit and Run came out, it was filled to the brim with memorable quotes, characters, and ragdoll physics so absurd this might as well just be GTA. Seriously, you could just mow people over and they're like, oh gosh dang it, sure sucks that you broke my whole body, although you'll be mostly here Homer or whoever you're playing as talk about how smart they are. SMRT. I am too smart. SMRT. While a majority of the game is spent in vehicle, there's several on foot segments, most of which dive into a little platforming. The quality of that action varies, but it employs a lot of the familiar GTA mechanics here, namely the hit and run. If you're a little excessive with the whole hitting pedestrians thing, you'll get Chief Wiggum on the scene. I like how this game just embraces its absurdity. Lisa and Bart are just driving real ass vehicles and getting away with Class C misdemeanors left and right. There's no justice in Springfield. Simpsons Hit and Run is a great Great Grand Theft Auto clone, great licensed game, and just a good time in general. But y'all already knew that. Although you might not have known that the developer, Radical Entertainment, was also responsible for that Scarface game. So, small world. You gotta wonder if they showed off Hit and Run as a proof of concept. I know there's probably more licensed clones out there, but I want to stop for now because I want to address the biggest elephant in the room, the game that became its own franchise, Saints Row. I think Saints Row was the first time growing up that my feeble brain recognized something and was like, hey, that looks familiar, boss. Similarly to true crime, Saints Row's popularity was big enough to become its own franchise, one that's been tossed between a few different publishers, but also one that's about to get its own reboot. And if we're being like straight up, Saints Row 2 is one of my favorite games ever. I think I like it more than any Grand Theft Auto game, but that's a conversation for later. Saints Row was Volition's first attempt at something 7th gen, and I always thought they knocked it out of the park. I was one of those freak kids who rented the Descent games from a grocery store in like 96, so I was aware of who they were, but they were really popping out high quality stuff back to back. Red Faction, Summoner, you name it. So when it became their turn to make something Grand Theft Auto inspired, they decided to go with a simple concept, gang warfare. <laughs> Over the years, especially when GTA 4 came out, they began to embrace a bit more of a serious tone with hard-hitting dramatic moments. Saints Row 1 said nah and gave us the town of Stillwater, a ridiculous amount of tools for destruction and said have fun. It really just took on the persona of being like that fake video game you'd see in the back of movies, complete with the ridiculous combo multipliers. Who said you needed to take yourself seriously? Hope you don't mind hepatitis. What? While Grand Theft Auto and other attempts at the genre had a lot of things for the players to do, I don't think any of them capitalized on it quite like this. Step one to making a fun game though, give me a character creator, one where I can do this. He's beautiful. In between main story missions with each of the gangs, you need to increase your respect. After all, you're basically a baby as far as the saints are considered. So you do that by dressing for the job you want and covering yourself in purple, taking on other gangs, and most importantly, doing activities. These are bonkers. You can escort escorts, participate in mayhem, do a little drug trafficking, join the demolition derby, fight rival pimps, race other gang members, or even participate in insurance fraud. All of this way worse than your average Grand Theft Auto game. By the time the sequel, Saints Row 2, rolled around, they were letting the players do stuff that makes San Andreas blush. It's no hot coffee, though. The original isn't perfect, far from it, but it's step one towards the sequel, which I think was genuinely a fantastic game. Imagine everything I said, but it's 100% co-opable, it has a story that has a lot more heart, and gameplay progression that'll keep you hooked start to finish. I'm still waiting on a remaster, considering the PC port's a little terrible. At the very least, if you own an Xbox One, the first First game is playable on that with backwards compatibility and it runs like a charm. Smooth as butter, so you can go commit insurance fraud by ping-ponging off of cars at 60 FPS all day. I would love if they could port the second one to modern consoles, but unfortunately, it seems unlikely. I love me some Saints Row. Looking forward to the reboot, but we'll talk about that another time. Saints Row Retrospective, am I right, guys? 
Who's who's with me? All right, I got one more game I want to talk about, and it's easily the most forgotten of the bunch. Now, a lot of these games we've been talking about have been based off of licensed properties or have been turned into franchises by some means, but not many of them are just like a solo game by itself. Well, by Danish developer Deadline Games comes the borderline offensive Total Overdose, A Gunslinger's Tale in Mexico. I have feelings. I only know about Total Overdose due to an X-Play review back in the day where all they talked about were stereotypes and its uninspired GTA-ness. What they didn't get into was the fact that this game has a lot of cool gameplay mechanics that felt like they combined the open world aspects of Grand Theft Auto with the gunplay of Max Payne. So yeah, you can jack cars here and there, explore a full open world, and commit all kinds of questionable activities, but in style. If you've ever wanted to pull off a double headshot while doing something straight out of the Matrix, be my guest. Total Overdose has a double protagonist fake out. You start out as Ernesto Cruz, a deep undercover DEA agent who's double crossed on his mission in the jungle. Then you play as his son years later, Tommy, who's also a DEA agent. He goes to Mexico to investigate the gang he thinks was responsible for his father's death and then he's seriously wounded after his first mission. Then we take control of his twin brother, our main protagonist, Ramiro, a total dirtbag who until just now was in prison. Not really knowing anything about this game, I kept being like, when am I going to play as a dude who looked like he would pour his coffee out on the sidewalk, and here we are. So you're taking orders from your twin brother while just wanting to go back to prison, doing all kinds of crazy stunts, and your typical GTA fare. But I don't remember GTA letting me do this. Yo, Total Overdose's gameplay and combat is, it's a good time. Keeping it mid 90s, every mission has a score meter that you need to fill up in order to unlock certain things. Every time you get a kill, you get a multiplier rolling, Tony Hawk style. So you're literally bouncing off of walls and shooting dudes in slow motion, and the fancier you are, the higher the score. Then you get what are called loco moves. These attacks are cool specials that you can use to take it up a notch. You got the golden gun from Bond that's an instant kill, a tornado spin, or my favorite, El Toro. If you've ever wanted to RP, as a bull while racking up points, this game is for you. Total Overdose is super fun to play. It's just unfortunately kind of shrouded in a highly unimaginative, extremely stereotype fueled narrative and world. And it doesn't help that the main character is unlikable by design. If you ask me, this is one of those games you skip the cutscenes with, bump up the music, and enjoy the gameplay of. Thankfully, you can actually pick this one up on GOG, so it's playable. Well, it's one of those things that came out in 2005, had close to no notoriety, and then disappeared, which is a shame because mechanically, it's pretty pretty good. There's just a lot of this. Okay, amigo. What I'm gonna do now is go inside, dig my enchilada, hangover cure, and get my hair back into maximum padrissimo position. There's actually a PSP spinoff called Chili Con Carnage that focuses mostly on the gameplay, but it's less of a GTA clone and more of a straight action game. There was a sequel being made called Total Overdose 2 Tequila Gunrise that was gonna be way bigger, comprising an entire map of Mexico, but that disappeared whenever the publisher Eidos pulled out. I don't know about y'all, but I think I miss games like this. They're not the whole stereotype thing, but the B game. Double A. Games that may not be top of the line, but aren't quite indie either. Considering no company could really match the budgets and scales of Grand Theft Auto back in the day, a lot of these clones treaded that category. I don't think anyone out there was wowed by something like the Saboteur, but I was. I loved that game. I even input the booby code. Total Overdose is a fun game that I think you should check out if you don't mind a stupid crass time. It's no bear in the big blue house, but it's certainly not Postal 2, or whatever Duke Nukem Forever 2001 was gonna be. Basically, you can't just pee on things, so that's a plus. So there you have it, Grand Theft Auto clones, a category of games that's kind of fading out with time. In 2022, these big open world experiences are really expensive to make, so you just don't see them as much anymore. Plus, these days it seems like everyone's kind of modeling the Ubisoft model, and I mean, that's just okay, so we're gonna be seeing less and less GTA clones as time moves on. Unfortunately. Now I know there's a bunch of these I didn't have the chance to talk about, like Godfather 2, Wheelman, and The Getaway, so if you want to see those and maybe some others I forgot about, let me know down in the comments below and I will check them out. But if you're really asking me to play every single dirtbag crime man open world video game for one video, you're crazy. I, I just can't. I'll die. But hey, look, we hit 200,000 subscribers. I literally cannot thank all of you guys enough for supporting me and the channel. It makes me ecstatic, to be honest. So in celebration for 200,000 subscribers, I was trying to think of what to do and I decided, you know what? Let's do another charity stream. So on the 11th of June, which is a week and a half from right now, I'm gonna be doing a charity stream for Planned Parenthood because 
I live in Texas. What else is there to say? You can follow me over at twitch.tv forward slash slash interruption or check my Twitter if I have any updates or last minute things that need to happen and my cats are fighting again. Guys, come on. I'm gonna be pitching some money of my own in, of course, and hopefully all of us together, we can raise some awareness and do good things. Thank you all so much for all the support throughout the years, especially, I mean, 200,000 subscribers is not a small number. It gives a guy like me an opportunity to live and I can't thank you all enough. So let's raise some money together on the 11th of June, starting at noon, and I will see you guys then. Anyways, that's all for now. I'm Austin and catch me next time when we talk about some good licensed games. <laughs> that was Freya. <laughs> Freya. Thank you all so much for watching. Special Patreon shout out to Blackfoot Ferret, Chris Shelton, Christopher Olivia, Darren Newton, Doug Prince, DX Buster, David Molnar, Elijah, GM Pinks, Hey Quiggles, J Roos, Jacoby Fitzpatrick, Kevin Zanowski, Kieran Arder, Nick Irving, P Funk, Randall Bentley, Ryan Talbert, and Shazan. Thank you all so much for your generous support. I have a lot of content coming down the pipeline. I've been working with some more people lately to make sure that I can bring as much to you as I can. I'm really excited for what's on the horizon. And please make sure to stop by the charity stream if you can and give if you can as well. There's no pressure, but everything that you do helps us make the world a little bit better. I guess if I were to have an actual 200,000 video, it's one that's going to be coming up in about two weeks from now. So stay tuned for that. Love you all. See you next time.